supporting community call. Um, the structure of this is, well, even before I do that, I just wanted to introduce a few of, of, of my team that are on the, the call today. One, you, you heard his voice, but uh, now you see him in action. Jim, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, I'm not on mute, so I can just jump right in. Uh, my name is Jim. If you were able to attend the uh, webinar uh, last week, that was my voice that you heard. It probably is starting to sound annoyingly familiar as I talk right now. I'm the uh, program and policy analyst here, and among other things, what that means is that I uh, design and execute and, and oftentimes evaluate uh, communities of practice uh, like this one. So. Uh, uh, the other one of the other one of my other major responsibilities is I uh, provide uh, technical assistance in the domain of adult and youth cessation for uh, between eight and nineteen uh, county level public health agencies here in Colorado. So a lot of the health neighborhood work that we've been doing and the and, and how we've developed that concept has been done in conjunction with our uh, local state department of health here. Okay. Thanks, Jim and Christine. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Christine Gerber Apgar, um, and I um, am the Research and Evaluation Director for the Behavioral Health and Wellness Program. Um, so I'm helping um, kind of figure out how best to um, evaluate this learning community, but also some other initiatives that are um, going on in Arizona. So I'm just sort of sitting in, in the background and um, taking in um, all the great work that everybody's doing and um, getting some ideas for how to kind of evaluate the work and, and show what everybody is going to be doing um, in the state. So that's my role. Thanks, Christine. And so let's go ahead and do, there's a, uh, at least one person on the phone, so I want to make sure we know who's joining us. Um, and so we'll do a quick uh, quick roll call. Irene, I, I see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, Joanne, I see you. Happy Thursday to you. Um, Martha is on the phone or on the on the computer. Uh, Tony is, has joined us. Tracy, uh, Jan, Michelle, uh, Charles just got on, and there's one other person on the phone. So who did I miss? Hi, Chad. This is Lee in Pima County. I was sure hoping you would join us today, Lee. <laughs> Since you're presenting a little, presenting your topic in a little bit. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Uh, and I think, let's see if anyone else is on right now. I think that's it for now. So good. We've got a good group today. So the structure is that uh, of the learning community calls is that we do a, a really quick recap initially of the webinar that preceded the learning community call. So Jim's going to, in a minute, give a a quick recap of the, in this case, the Health Neighborhood webinar you did. And then after that, we're gonna ask uh, Lee to uh, talk about uh, the Pima County uh, initiative that, that uh, she's heading up and with her compatriots, some of them on the, on the phone today. And then we really just open it up and have a dialogue based on uh, possibly uh, Lee and Pima County will have some questions that they wanna ask of all of you. You might have some questions of Pima County, and we can veer off course too. And so if we want to get off on uh, any kind of tangent based on, we'll just see where the, where the conversation takes us. Uh, so with that, Jim, why don't I hand it over to you for a, a quick recap of the webinar. Yeah, sure. Uh, so just a, a quick housekeeping thing. I've went ahead and, and muted everybody. And so uh, just because clicks and clacks and getting and sending emails can always cause a little bit of distraction. So if you do want to uh, chime in while I'm talking or at the point when it's opened up for conversation, be sure to, we'll try to unmute you before, but if we miss it, uh, you can always unmute yourself. Uh, so this is a really, really, really uh, high level recap of the 45 minutes that I talked last week on the health neighborhood. And, and if I were to condense all of that material down, I would say that, um, some of the key takeaways are, are that we've known for a really long time that we needed something like the health neighborhood. The public health world has uh, has been studying what they call the social determinants of health or the, the, the straightforwardly determinants of health for a really long time, about 30, 35 years or more. Um, 
in sort of an intense study area. And uh, there's always been a lot of talk about moving interventions upstream. And sort of in the mid 90s to early 2000s, what that was largely interpreted to mean was community-based interventions. And that's been fine as far as they go. There's always a recognition that you need, when you work in the communities, those uh, initiatives should be run by trusted leaders in the communities. And those have always uh, been hard to develop or hard to find sometimes, excuse me. Uh, and so what we've ended up doing is sort of uh, defaulting toward public health led initiatives that are sort of located in communities. And that's fine, uh, but that's just where we've been and that's as far as it's gone. Uh, to respond to this from a different angle, uh, the, the patient-centered medical home was developed within the medical field uh, and that then eventually expanded out to the medical uh, patient-centered medical neighborhood. And it's based on the same idea that, the, that complex conditions, upstream causes, these require more robust uh, approaches to care. And then uh, where uh, the patient-centered medical home, patient-centered medical neighborhood were able to succeed, we're in the realms of developing uh, continuity of care practices uh, and health navigation. Like those sort of, those two things sort of went hand in hand. And now in the, what, what's happening is uh, public health is really trying to figure out better ways to engage communities, to expand innovation in communities. Uh, and, it's, and so the patient-centered medical home on the one side and public health 3.0 are sort of meeting in the middle to find these really genuine uh, upstream interventions that can really make large scale impacts on an individual's health. The issue that, that uh, BHWP has been running into over the lot because we've been pushing to on on very similar fronts over the course of our existence since the early 2000s and one of the things that uh, we keep finding is that when uh, when public health or when uh, you know other community partners think about community interventions with large-scale impact um, for tobacco uh, they tend to think policy level interventions which is to say they think of things like price increases and advertising campaigns. And those are fine and they're effective, but we can do better. And one of the things that, that happens when we do things like price increases or um, uh, large scale educational campaigns is that we do drive quit attempts, but then we leave people largely unsupported at the point of care. That is to say, we, we, they don't have points of care or if they have people they have, that they have say, for example, a, a primary care provider, those primary care providers aren't actually educated in tobacco cessation best practices. And so are, is, there, is there essentially a meso level, a middle level that's between the primary care provider on the one hand and public health uh, tobacco control policies on the other? And we think the answer is in this public health 3.0, aka the health neighborhood uh, viewpoint. So it's something that we, we've known has been needed for a long time and we're uh, really excited to be teaming up with innovative, passionate partners like you guys to help us figure out what that really looks like in the field. What can we do uh, to, to really drive, to motivate quit attempts and then to also support them, especially in our uh, hardest to reach communities, so those the low SES or other marginalized communities. And the way that uh, I would like, to, like everybody to think about starting off is to think about the five A's, which is an evidence-based best practice that we know does those things. It motivates quit attempts and it supports them. If you, can, if you think about, uh, rather than thinking about like five or six or seven or eight places where you can get a, a, a community partner to do the two A's and an R or to do the five A's, is there a way to conceptualize the community as multiple points of, it, points of entry into the five A's? How many people in the community can you get to be doing screening? How many people in the community can you get to be doing a basic assessment? And then how many of those individuals can you get to be doing uh, referrals to more intensive services, provided that more intensive services exist? And if they don't, can you persuade a person or a community or an organization to perform that more intense function? So to think about your communities in terms of the five A's, which of the A's are already being performed, how many and how often, and which ones aren't. And then public health's role is then in developing the connections between each of those sites, which is a, which is a, a role that, that public health is sort of uniquely positioned uh, to make because not just in your tobacco programs, but in your other chronic disease efforts, your other public health educational work, your, your relationships with schools and community behavioral health, and of course within the, uh, multi-unit housing and jail systems as well. So there's a lot of uh, potential like overlapping communities, overlapping in the sense of that they're serving 
similarly hard to reach health disparate uh, uh, populations. And we wanna frame all of that under the umbrella term of the health neighborhood. And that's sort of like the, that's the quick rundown of everything I said last week. So I'll turn it over to, to Chad now. Yeah, thanks Jim, appreciate it. Uh, and before we move to uh, Lee describing a little bit about uh, what's going on in Pima, did anyone have questions about the, the webinar or any clarifying comments for Jim? And remember that you are muted. Okay, so hearing none, can I turn it over to you, Lee, to, to talk a little bit about your initiative and, and who you're partnering with and anything else you'd like to share? Sure, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you well. <laughs> Yay, I did it the right way. <laughs> um, well, happy Thursday, everybody. Friday is right around the corner. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of, maybe I'll give you a kind of a brief overview of some of the work that we've been doing leading up to a strategy that I believe we've identified um, that would fit into the model for the COP um, tobacco uh, focus for justice involved population. Um, over the past year, we've had the opportunity to work with various community partners um, our housing partners, um, partners from the Federal Reserve Bank, um, and other community organizations here. Uh, to, and the idea was we wanted to focus on what continuity of care looked like for folks regarding health and housing in general. Um, and as you all know, a lot of times when we go out to talk about tobacco, tobacco generally isn't very palatable to a lot of folks in the community and can be a very sensitive topic. And so really thinking about tobacco uh, being a modifiable health risk factor that fits in wellness models comprehensively when we look at health and housing and how to introduce that um, has been significant for us during this past year. So in meeting with um, our partners, we were over the past year finally able to plan and implemented a health and housing round table on May 23rd of this year that we were able to bring folks from um, the Department of Corrections, um, other housing authority folks, um, Arizona Complete Health, um, United, um, just a, a, our a housing partners, I think I mentioned that already, um, schools, that kind of thing. We were able to bring a lot of leaders together at the table just to, to have an initial discussion about, about where we hope to go regarding health and housing and what continuity of care would look like. Um, so that, that the, the, I would say the, the work in, in really reaching out to community partners to build relationships has been something that we've been trying to do for the past year and a half to really keep folks at the table regarding tobacco cessation, continuity of care, and what affordable housing and availability for affordable housing would look like and to, work, to meet folks where they're at. So that discussion's been happening. We've also, in regards to youth vaping, we've been able to, um, over the past year, um, establish a really great partnership with the Pima County Superintendent and his team in his office. And in Pima County, there's 17 school districts. And I, I want to say we have over in public, in public schools, we have over 140,000 students. Um, and so it's been, it's been a real great opportunity to think about when we talk about vape prevention messaging and what a campaign would look like to address the vaping epidemic that we have, um, how to reach parents and teachers and primary care physicians. It's been a great partnership that we've had um, with the Pima County superintendent, his team, and then now several, many of the school districts. And that work is, is, is ongoing. Um, because, of, because of the Health and Housing Roundtable, 
because of all the work that we've been doing in the school environment. Um, and now we have an opportunity to focus on the model to establish continuity of practice with a medical neighborhood centered. Um, we've really been trying to wrap our brain around what, what that looked like here in Pima and where, where did these different initiatives intersect. We've also been very fortunate to work with a couple of MPH students from U of A. One of our interns has been conducting um, lit, lit review, uh, community assessment regarding health and housing um, for the past several months as well and been collecting data. Um, and so we've, we've had the opportunity to kind of just in general go out and, and continue the conversation with some of the partners that attended the Health and Housing Roundtable to really get an idea when it comes to populations for folks that are just as involved, where, where are the gaps and, and what work is already happening for reentry, where are the services being provided, are we seeing trends with certain populations of, of people regarding in and out of being incarcerated. Um, and so all in all, um, I think we've been able to identify a specific need um, really working with the, the juveniles 21 years and younger. Um, and I'll kind of give you a little additional information. One of the Pima County school districts um, is called the Accommodation School District. That school district has two schools. One is in the detention center, one is in the jail, and it's for youth who are in trouble 21 years and younger. Um, and in Pima County in general, funds come in for public schools to the superintendent's office. The superintendent then divvies that the funding for public school education to each of the school districts, and then it's up to the school districts to decide how to implement and what they do with that funding. Except for the accommodation school district, the superintendent runs that school district. In the state of Arizona, each student for public housing receives the funding for, for education is based upon $1 per student head, essentially in general for public education. In the accommodation school district in Pima County for young people 18 years and younger, the funding drops down to 72 cents. And then for young people who are 18 to 21, the funding drops down to zero. Um, and so there's a true inequity when we look at what resources are being provided um, within the, the funding that they have across Pima County in general for young people under the age of 21, especially for those that are justice involved. And so there's this heightened sense from our team um, that we've been working with our small group um, based upon the Health and Housing Roundtable that there is this tremendous need um, within that school district and definitely based upon feedback from the Pima County superintendent and his team as well. So I feel like all of these different initiatives and strategies that we've been working on and all the work and collaboration that's been, been involved over the past year and a half has really brought us to a point where these initiatives are intersecting to focus on the accommodation school district um, and so when we talk about goals moving forward, I really feel, we really feel that there needs to be a very comprehensive community assessment for that district as to what services are being provided by what organizations, what data is being collected. Um, there's no follow-up data on young people that come in and out of that school district. So when it comes to even thinking about potential funding down the road or what a medical neighborhood would look like or funding for that or to help allocate resources, we really won't know until some type of comprehensive assessment is conducted. That's just, that's just my thought. So our first goal 
in regards to these strategies would be to think about conducting that assessment. Next goal for us um, in the near future would think about, would be not think about, would be to connect with staff that are providing resources or have direct connect with the young people in the accommodation school district. Think about what training on some evidence-based strategies would look like for those folks to help us provide tobacco cessation, vape prevention, cessation interventions for young people that are addicted to nicotine as a part of one of the health resources that's being provided and to start the ball rolling with that work. And that would be in partnership with the American Lung Association or some other community partners as well. Um, longer term goals would be to continue to develop our, our round table group. Um, perhaps that would be a task force group moving forward that would be more specific to work that would be identified um, and partners that, that would own strategies to work on. Um, developing and focusing on justice involved for juvenile population, um, continue to build that group. And also long-term goals would be to think about what, what does the medical neighborhood look like for that environment? What does housing, opportunities for housing to help connect these young people that leave that are 18 to 21 with housing with life skills, with job placement, and other resources like that that would be invaluable for them as well. So that's, I think in a nutshell, that's kind of where we're at at this point. Um, and it will be really exciting to see how we can move forward together. Really, th thank you very much for that. So you have so much going on that's <laughs> know where to start with some of my questions but before we get to comments and questions did you have um, questions of, of your peers that might be helpful sure it, I'm wondering if if anybody who has been providing because I know some of our county partners have been providing resources for young people in detention um, has anybody conducted any type of community assessment within that environment for young people and justice involved? And is there any other sort of school district that's set up that way for young people? In this case, in Pima, it's the accommodation school district. I'm just wondering if there's any other school district like that across the state. So we'll just open it up. Does anyone know of anything? Remember, you might be on mute, so remember to unmute yourself. So um, Lee, here in Pinal County, we do have a similar type school because we're not such a large uh, populated county. It's a smaller school, but it's called the Villa Oasis School and it is run um, by the county school superintendent's office. So basically the county school superintendent is the superintendent for this school. Um, it's, it's more like a charter school or a transition school to help kids um, who've had issues in the past uh, with dealing with public schools to kind of help them to transition into regular uh, school. So it's very similar. We've gone out there um, and done some education and prevention uh, whenever we've had the opportunity. Uh, because we're, we're a smaller county and because our population is smaller, we get a lot more requests for things like STDs and sexual health type presentations um, because that's what, what is in demand there. But yeah, any opportunity that we have to go out and provide, you know, any kind of, of tobacco education and, and prevention, you know, we, we're 
always willing and able to go out there and, and do that. But I don't know, do you find that, I mean, that, that there's a need or there is a demand um, at the accommodation school? I think there's, and thank you for sharing that, Joanne. I think there's a huge need, and it's, a lot of it is due to funding. Like it, the funding that goes in for, or is provided for that school district, um, because the district is run just like other school districts, there's just the funding, it's not a robust amount of funding. And so um, I feel like it's kind of like, I, I just get a sense and I don't know without really doing, like I said, some type of assessment that there's resources being provided. I just don't know how comprehensive they are. And again, there's no follow-up for these young people when they leave there. But other counties. So the second part I heard Lee was the assessment part. So would this be specific to the schools or just an overall kind of mapping assessment you were looking for? So we've we've been working with a couple other MPH students to do in general assessments with the other school districts um, regarding vaping. Mm. And so this this would be a very especially for this particular strategy that we're looking at would be more comprehensive and would be specific to the accommodation school district. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not aware of anything offhand. I don't know, Jim or Christine, if you know of anything. I I, I don't. I'm, I'm 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 certain that other parts of the country probably do something similar, uh, but I, I am curious, uh, Lee, when, when you say like the, you're sort of. Uh, if I'm, if I'm understanding you right, this would be an extension of what you've already done with youth vaping in the non-accommodation districts, uh, but that you want to do a needs assessment that's uh, maybe a little bit more uh, focused, more refined for this particular population. Are you, are you thinking of expanding, like building on, the, on, the, on whatever you did for vaping, uh, but by looking at, I don't know, other substances, other uh, social needs, what, what are you hoping to um, deploy in that environment? So I think it, it, it's at least to get in and be able to provide some of the resources that we would provide just the same to the rest of the school districts. So would be diversion and inter cessation interventions for young people under the age of 18. And then also looking at interventions for those that are 18 to 21. Uh -huh. um, but really being able to provide training to the staff there that are already providing health resources perhaps, or educating in some, some um, capacity. That would be the initial sort of thought. And again, I'm gonna go back to the fact that I really believe without having some type of assessment and having data to really be able to identify um, deliverables and, and what outcomes would look like and sustainability and how to really bring in partners where needed. Um, without that assessment, I just don't, it would be like going in with a blindfold on, I think. I mean, without being really efficient. Right. And then on the on this funding issue, the, the kids 18 or below 18 are getting 70, 72% of the, the funding that's not, that's outside accommodations and 18 to 21 is getting zero. Uh, it, has anybody provided a, a rationale or budget? Like, I, is it the case that a higher percentage of these students are, are getting their uh, classes online or because they don't facilitate uh, sporting events for them? Like, do you, is there anybody who's explained like why the, the discrepancy is so broad? The, you know, I'm sure it's, it's, I can 
just speculate. I'm only speculating because of the, the conversations that we've had. Um, and the superintendent, um, Pima County does a really, he's, he's very well spoken when it comes to this topic. It's very near and dear to his heart. Um, and I just, I feel like there's a lot of political motive behind why the funding is the way it is. Um, and so I, I don't know if that really answers your question. <laughs> It's it's getting there, and it also answers my next question, which is how 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 in, how in communication with the superintendent are you? When when Joanne asked whether there is a, an expressed or manifested need in that, uh, I'm wondering like even if you designed like a really great way of reaching into the accommodations district, mm -hmm. is there the is the political will will there to have you be able to actually provide uh, even basic like navigation connection based? This the superintendent is extremely supportive of all the work that we're doing. Um, the first question he's always going to ask, um, and again, I don't want to speak for him, but the first question that we're always asked is, is there funding available? And can you go in, who can go in to provide or help provide training for or, or connect? Like they may have the people to do the work, but who can pay them to do it? Right. Is always kind of the question because it, it would take a very special um, and somebody that's very familiar with working with that population um, to really, you know, to engage with, to be motivating, empower those young people to process, mm -hmm. um, to really get there. And so there is a tremendous amount of motivation to, for change and to think about things um, you know, increase in funding and re increase in resources and looking at policies because that's that's sort of the other thing um, that always comes into the conversation. So, can I ask a question of Lee? Um, so. Am I correct in thinking, as I've been listening to you describe this needs assessment, that the target audience of some kind of some kind of an assessment that you'd like to conduct with the accommodation school district would be um, some kind of funder or county entity that? So, what you'd be trying to demonstrate with your assessment? is you know not whether what you're doing is working but rather what 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 are the gaps in services J really just making the case of what the need is in that community so that then you could put together some kind of presentation or something that to, to a potential funder for actual services is that kind of what you're thinking in terms of the needs assessment yeah, and, and really looking at it from different levels within the accommodation school district. So feedback and data from not only community partners providing resources, but from healthcare. So maybe Arizona Complete Health data, demographic data, policy data, um, what policies are in place, court policies, that kind of thing, um, parents, parental like environment, if they go home, where do they go home? Do they have a home? Or are they on the street? So it, it's really, and being able to get feedback and data from staff, staff turnover, workforce development, really looking at it very comprehensively, I think. So okay. that we can, we can get a better idea, yes, of where the gaps are and what, what to be able to identify priorities for continuity of care moving forward and how we bring the right folks to the plate and definitely to look for future funding for that. And, and Lee, do you happen to know, are, to the, are they, is uh, the accommodations district already running a certain like tier one mental health services? I'm thinking like, uh, you know, life skills or second step or anything like that, but you might just sort of be able to attach a program like this onto and maybe that person would be the right person whoever is facilitating those groups 
to run those sorts of interventions for you. Right, and we, um, one of our other programs here at the health department um, is just starting to go in and do some of those mental health, um, other substance misuse type of programs. Mm -hmm. um, and really, again, it's not us really thinking about going in and providing that direct service, but more of how can we, how, who's doing it without overburdening, because I don't even know what that looks like right now. Right. Is, it, is it training maybe an Arizona Complete Health staff or subcontractor um, who's funded healthcare-wise to provide resources? So, so it's really, it, but that's a good point. It's really being able to kind of look at what, you know, initially for, for tobacco cessation interventions, um, who can we partner with more immediate to train um, to help get these additional resources in there? Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking that, you know, uh, if we think of this as a sort of a, a staged approach where maybe you don't get exactly what you want in six months, but if we think about developing a relationship over the course of a year or two, uh, getting something in there that's already sort of an established Thing in the district, uh, in the larger Tucson area school districts, um, I, I know that uh, Tucson had. Other, I know that there are school systems in Tucson that use uh, life skills. I'm sure that uh, some of these more justice adjacent systems are using things like uh, Alert or Second Step because they those are like other substances, but also sometimes for aggressive aggressive behavior. So if they're, I, I suspect they're already doing something like that. Uh, and if not, that that might be a foray in. Right, like if you can get help, get them help them get that established. Then what you're doing is sort of like on the side, you're developing the infrastructure that you can leverage later for the tobacco specific stuff. And something like uh, uh, life skills can you can just add tobacco modules to as long as the person who's facilitating is somewhat somewhat trained. But if, if even if they can't get trained to do the intervention, if you can provide them information that they can share, they're normally able to do that. And it's sort of a really, really low burden, but also low impact, um, you know, first step so that you can then maybe grow in eight or nine months into something a little bit more robust. Right. And we, you know, we talked, I talked about the significance of continuing to fine tune, I'm going to call it a task force for lack of better defined of this group, but the health and housing roundtable group that we had, but to fine tune, continue to bring folks together, um, even from housing, for instance, that we're still working towards continuity of care using this model. If there is an opportunity to assist parents that maybe need support for housing or connected to it, it's really, we're able to have resources on hand to provide that that type of assistance when you know thinking outside the box as we work towards that long-term goal. Um, I definitely wanted to open it up to the again to others on the call. Is other does anyone else work with school systems in this respect or have any other insights? Lee, you're on the forefront. You're cutting a new, cutting new path. <laughs> well, and I, you know, I'm really excited. Um, and I, I just, the more that I, I learn about, you know, the different initiatives and the more I've, we've really put a lot of thought and really have tried to wrap our brain about how to, how to intersect the different strategies that we're working on in a very meaningful way. And I, I really feel like we're going in the right direction. I just don't know what it looks like yet, mm -hmm. but it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. Did you have other questions too? You know what, those, those are kind of the two biggest questions that I have right now. I, 
was just that if anybody had conducted an assessment mm -hmm. like that, um, and I know we have county partners that are doing a tremendous amount of work in the schools in general when it comes to vape prevention and tobacco prevention and education. Um, so we've been fortunate that, that we've had the opportunity over years past to continue to partner together and to keep in contact with each other. So from that perspective, I feel like in general, I have an idea of, of you know, what we're all trying to do together. But for, for this population, for justice involved young people, for youth, um, that's, it's a whole, it's a whole nother topic and new area for me. Mm -hmm. Do others have any, any questions of Lee before, because uh, we at BHWP don't want to, I mean, I have plenty of questions, but I don't want to monopolize. So what's uh, other thoughts or, or questions? Hi, this is Martha Martin. I work with Lee and yeah, hi Martha. So I look at this a little differently. I completely support and embrace Lee's high-level efforts. I think to address some very complex policy issues and questions. You know the way money's committed to the students at Pima County, but I'm trying to as. Lee says, wrap my brain around this, you know, the five A's and how we can work with our current health and housing roundtable partners. For example, we have someone from the um, Micro Business and Housing Development Corporation, it's called PEP. So do we want to ask them, how, how would you deal with the five A's with the children that may be involved in detention, accommodation district? Can you screen your, your clients? Can you motivate them to see a doctor? Can you do an assessment? Or should we ask the people in, uh, maybe in the employment uh, training program or the community action agency? I mean, children aren't gonna go through there, but maybe, maybe we ask you know, parents who are coming in, they've lost their job, maybe they have a kid in detention, and we say, hey, by the way, you know, do you have any children who are dealing with drug addiction or tobacco or whatever and like these intake people they can ask this extra question or the home repair program guys they go in and they assess a home for home repair with the cbdg program can we ask them to say you know if they notice a child in the in the house there you know who's looking you know should be in school and he's home and maybe ask the question hey you know do your, do your children need some, some health care or do they have an issue with tobacco? And if so, they could say, yeah, you know, I could really use some help. And then this home repair person could say, well, I'm going to refer you to Lee <laughs> or someone else. I mean, are we trying to reach community partners who in their respective fields of social work, housing, you know, Section 8 intake staff, or are, are we trying to use them, invite them to be a part of this neighborhood medical community where everybody's on alert for this medical issue and they know to refer people to doctors, clinics. And what about all these urgent care centers that have popped up? Are they a potential partner? A lot of people go there. I've, I go there, you know, instead of waiting to see my doctor or go to the emergency center, there's all kinds of potential customers there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just jump in. This is Jim. Um, so, when, when we think about, uh, so this really grows out of the idea of facilitating health systems change, uh, which has been around for a really long time, but really picked up steam after uh, ACA was passed, uh, you know, and went into effect in 2010. And uh, the idea there being like, is there way, are there small ways that we can sort of tighten up systems? And in our world, that means primarily, uh, you know, we know it's an evidence-based best practice to get every, absolutely everybody gets asked, are you a tobacco user at absolutely every single visit into a hospital, a clinic, their PCP, uh, urgent care, pharmacist, dentist, right? All the medical sites and all the medical adjacent sites. We also know that that doesn't happen. That's a pie in the sky goal, but it's not our reality. And so facilitating health systems change sort of starts there. 
uh, public health engages with the medical system, says, uh, this is our goal, we want 100%, where are you guys at? And what can we do to help you like tighten up that number, get closer to the goal? And then the next step, of course, is uh, advise and then, and then eventually uh, services or referral. And then e at each step, we can say, like, what can we do systemically? What, are there policies and procedures we can change? Are there protocols? Is it education and training? You know, is it role playing? Is it attaching it to other initiatives? Like, what are the things that we can do to get these numbers where we know they really ought to be to hit the high, to get the, left, the greatest impact from them? And so when you when you say like our urgent care uh, potential partner, yeah, absolutely. And they, they already have a, a, a charter and a mandate to be asking. The question is, are they? And then if they do ask, it's infuriating to me <laughs> uh, that there are medical systems that that hear a yes response and then have absolutely no uh, protocols for what to do after that. They don't advise the person to quit or if they do advise them, they don't track that. Uh, and if they do advise them to quit, they don't give them any support services to quit. And some of that is that they don't know where they are, and some of that is they don't know how. In the case of the quit line, they might not know how to actually make a referral to the Arizona ASH line. They might not be connected up to e-referral, or they don't, might, they don't know the fax number. It could be something really basic. Uh, the health neighborhood is, is very similar uh, with the idea that it's, it's, if, if getting to 100% screening in a medical center is pie in the sky, well, the health neighborhood is, is is even higher in a bigger sky, <laughs> right? Because uh, ideally, yeah, we I, the biggest potential health neighborhood would be that every single person in in every within whatever jurisdiction you want to manage, that's Pima County. Uh, every single person has an opportunity at some point in their regular day that where they will across they will run across an opportunity to get screened, self screening, or uh, they'll engage with a professional who knows how to do that, a pharmacist or you know, or they'll get a self, they'll see a self-referral sign uh, to, the, to the ash line in their supermarket, whatever it is, right? There's going to be a screening opportunity. And if the screening opportunity, the screening opportunity should all go, should be directing them to somebody who can actually help them professionally. That's the idea. So in order to do that, uh, that's where public health comes in because you are the people who are best suited to say, these are the physical places where we can develop screeners. These are the physical places where we can uh, put posters for the ash line these are the people that we can train uh, to make good referrals or to provide basic cessation counseling services whatever that is uh, so it's easier to think of it so sort of to conceptualize it it's easier to think of like smaller communities like the residents of the multi-unit housing right like a really basic it, it's not when I say basic it's it's a simple idea it's not necessarily easy to do is to just train uh, in conjunction with the, the housing authority uh, train a healthcare navigator that works as an employee of the multi-unit housing, uh, either that building or the larger system, where they meet with residents who are identified as smokers. And they have to be identified as smokers because HUD is now smoke-free. So every time they identify a smoking resident, that person is immediately, I, I, I'll use the sort of callous term of interviewed, but sort of assessed, right? Like, where do they go during the day? What Transportation services are they utilizing? Is it Uber? Is there a shuttle that takes seniors out to the uh, to go shopping during the day? When they go shopping, are they going to the grocery store? Are they going to clothing stores? Are they going to the local uh, thrift establishment? Then reaching out to those areas and saying, okay, how can we get them involved? How can we get the Salvation and, uh, Army involved in an educational campaign or a referral to service? Can we get counselors, cessation counselors embedded in the Salvation Army. I mean, the, the, the possibilities here are endless and I can sort of riff on them all day, but the general idea is to start with a community and just figure out where they live and where, how they engage with the rest of Pima County and then uh, figure out where your biggest bang for your buck is, where your highest passion is, and then try to develop those partnerships. Uh, and always thinking about those five A's. With these people, like this is a grocery store, we're not gonna ask them to make referrals, but we can engage them. We can have them uh, take down their their tobacco signage. We can't have them put up quit line signage, that kind of thing. And I'm happy, I've already talked to uh, Lee uh, and Rachel uh, last week, I'm happy to uh, chit chat with you about the 5A's conceptualization to offline. I'm, I'm wondering, Martha, for you, you know, through this process, how it's, because it sounds like the coalition was really focused on housing initially. And so kind of what this journey has been like for a member of the coalition. And if you have, you know, 
just thoughts, recommendations if, if uh, other counties are trying to establish similar coalitions? Well, uh, thank you for asking. I, I think, um, you know, we, Lee and I invited, well, Lee may recall, we had another round table in June of 2018, um, similar to the one that the health department organized for May 23rd, 2019. But anyway, we invited nonprofit housing developers and even people from uh, the local council offices, mayor and council have staff, uh, some of them participated. Um, uh, Lee and Mary extended the invitations to people in the correctional system, which was great. Um, but you're right, like back to the housing world, the nonprofit developers, the um, property managers, the Section 8 department. Um, I think that they're very interested in partnering with health care and, and, you know, the, the public housing or the Section 8 well, Section 8 vouchers are different than public housing, so public housing has to be smoke-free, but the Section 8 voucher holders go to the private market, and whether or not they're finding smoke-free housing, or if they can demand it, or if they have no choices there, I mean, maybe that's an opportunity to work with housing partners and the health department to help educate voucher holders that, you know, you have a right to smoke-free housing. And it's, it's so I think we need to focus on something. I mean, I feel like there's so many housing possibilities. There's so many people. Like focusing on the justice-involved youth is a little complicated because they may rely on parents or family or friends for housing. They're not actually the consumer. Well, they are, but they're not the ones that can pick a place to live usually. Mm -hmm. I, don't know, I feel like we need to focus a little, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, housing is a lot of different types of providers. It, it is, and, and you're absolutely right. Like, uh, you, there, the, since there are so many possibilities, so many different avenues, it really is critical to focus on exactly what you want to do and, and try to make an impact there. And let, because th these sorts of programs can grow into other sorts of programs. New partners can be brought in, but in order to do that, the first one needs to have some level of like demonstrable impact. And uh, I, I the way the way that I sort of recommend people to do is is have, just have them list uh, potential partners and sort of what the program would look like. If A was our partner, the program might look like this. If B was our partner, the program would look like this. Organize those in terms of uh, first your uh, like I think this is the best idea. I really want to do it this way. I want to do A, uh, but then also keeping in mind like you might want to reweight them under uh, our thinking of their potential willingness and passion because if if you don't have sort of intrinsic desire on the part of your community partner, it just becomes too much uh, personal labor on, on your part to, to really keep it going. Uh, and then make those phone calls and figure out, and it may turn out that B is really passionate, you were right in identifying that, uh, but you were completely off base on what they want to do as a program, and then is, is what they want to do you know, amenable to what you want to do, and then just say, okay, like, this is what we want to, then let's just do it. <laughs> if the answers are yes, yes, and yes, then just do it. Um, but I would start with uh, sort of a, just a really rough but completely malleable outline of our list of things that you'd like to do in that space and then go from there. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. And I, I would like to mention that at least two of our housing partners who receive funds to develop um, housing for special populations, um, when we when we suggested that they should have their housing smoke free, they objected right away because their clientele view smoking as their only stress reliever. I mean, it, you can't force them. I mean, at some point, maybe we can persuade them. And then another uh, group, they tried to offer smoking secession services on site at their property and they offered food and whatever, and no one came. <laughs> so yeah, this is hard. It is. Uh, you know, in terms of the second thing, the, the community-based in, endeavor, uh, there's, a, there's a, a nice solid literature on uh, trauma-informed public housing events that I think is worth reading. It, it, I think it's, it was, for me, it was a really enlightening read on why people do not show up to community events in, in public housing. Uh, and then so it, it also provides some alternatives to those kinds of community building exercises. It's not specifically tobacco-related or, or even health-related, but just generally, like, how do landlords um, or property owners establish community 
among a group of people who would are, are just self-isolating. Uh, and so that, that ends up explaining a lot about why this work is so hard, uh, but also uh, helps you develop alternative strategies, which is really nice. Uh, and you can also think about going upstream if you, if you uh, reach back up into the, the business community, the chambers of commerce, and also insurance providers. If you know that local um, public housing are using a, a specific liability insurer, they want those properties to be smoke free for their own reasons, for uh, uh, actuarial fiduciary reasons. And if you can get them to pressure the landlords back from the other side, or leave, it doesn't have to be like hard, like uh, all big sticks sort of pressure. It can be <laughs> a little softer, but uh, they might have ideas for how you can engage the landlords from the other side. Because it, you're absolutely right. Sometimes, sometimes landlords are like, no, absolutely not. It's a, it's a my obligation to my residents to let them do this. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they don't want to clean up. Uh, they don't want to do the, the smoke remediation. They don't want the fire risk. Uh, they don't want people smoking out in the parking lot. So a lot of landlords will jump on board, but then they sometimes get a little bit um, uh, heavy fisted with it. Good. Jim, I have a question. You had mentioned earlier that um, it, it's the general protocol for healthcare professionals to ask about tobacco use and to offer tobacco cessation. Is that the same for pharmacists as well? Do pharmacists have like a typical protocol where I, I know that they're supposed to counsel whenever anybody's getting new medication um, and they uh, typically if there is a reaction with the medication and, and tobacco use, you know, then then they're obligated to, you know, disclose that. But, you know, is there like a general kind of uh, protocol that they would use that would say, you know, ask about tobacco use, ask about cessation services, ask about any there, kind of needs like that? There, there, is a, there is a general protocol they can use and the professional organizations uh, inside of pharmacy, the American Pharmacological Association, uh, they're very much on board. And, and in fact, one of the uh, earliest sort of curricula for smoking interventions is called RX for Change, and it was developed for, by, by and for pharmacists to use. Uh, that said, uh, they don't get paid for it, generally speaking. There's a lot of movement in that direction as well, uh, both at the federal and at the individual state levels, uh, where pharmacists are now starting to get on board being able to be uh, paid prescribers, and in some cases, paid counselors, so getting reimbursed for counseling services. I, I have not looked into Arizona to see if that's the case. So, uh, and you know, I have a partner here that I'm working with and, and we, I, I was just talking to him, he's like, we can't get the chains on board. And then my, my very next conversation was with a Walmart pharmacist who's like, I'm on board. So, uh, I, I mean, it really does seem to be um, uh, up to the individual pharmacist. I, I would suggest that that was a, an avenue you wanted to pursue to start with your mom and pop chains, uh, the small stores, the non-chain places. Uh, although places like CVS uh, are just ideologically right there. They've already taken cigarettes out of the store. They have that urgent care clinic, so they have an RN uh, on staff, uh, typically. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're able to do it. But in, in the, the short answer is, uh, there is a, farm, a protocol they can use. It's established. It's been around for about 10 or 15 years, uh, but they're not doing it. So, uh, and, and I know that there's like, um, in pharmacists, you have two licensed professionals there. So is this, because you have the pharmacy techs as well as pharmacists, you know, or is that, this, is, is the same protocol for pharmacy techs? Because they're more the like direct communication with mm -hmm. the customers. And then my second question was like, um, in I don't know, maybe you probably don't know the answer to this, but like in tech school, pharmacy school, are they like trained to do tobacco cessation? Are they trained in the uh, five A's? Do, it, you know, is there any kind of you know, opportunity to uh, give them some uh, kind of certification uh, for that? Before, yeah. You know, I know I'm just cognizant of the time because we're mm -hmm. on the hour right now. Um, so I know that people are going to stop, start dropping off. But actually, this is a really rich area right now. That you bring up. And so I, I think that, that what we can do, we can also revisit this on uh, one of the next learning community calls. But Jim, can we send out some uh, resources to everyone? Uh, on, on I'll, send a, I'll send a website that at least updates uh, the policy changes that have been taking place uh, over the last couple of years and in terms of w what pharmacists are allowed to do, what they're paid to do, uh, reimbursed for. 
Uh, and that way you, we'll all know then if Arizona's on the list uh, or where they are in the process. And, uh, and if the answer is they're nowhere, then, you know, then we have an opportunity for advocacy. Uh, and then the other, all that really means is if you want to engage with pharmacists, you can, you're just not going to have the larger statewide institutional support. But it's still it's still a rich endeavor, and I'm if you want to, and I, we can chat about this for a really long time. You can just give me a phone call. Yeah, let's let's re definitely revisit this because I think that this is a, a theme that is coming up quite a bit right now, Joanne. So mm -hmm. it's really good talking about them, it's pharmacists specifically as part of the health neighborhood. But I know that I'm cognizant of people's time. We're a little about a minute over, so I really appreciate uh, everyone joining and your participation and. Uh, particularly uh, Lee and Pima County, thank you very much for kicking uh, kicking the learning community call series off. Uh, we look forward to seeing or, or having everyone join the next webinar, which is going to um, look at uh, drug courts or, or looking at working with uh, drug courts and other uh, types of court systems. And so uh, I might be reaching out to you a little bit on if anyone has information uh, specific to that topic as we're putting together the webinar. So thanks everyone, have a wonderful weekend and we will talk again soon. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you.